Muy buenas tardes. A nombre del Grupo de Investigación en Procesos Interculturales, Arquitectura, Urbanismo y Territorio. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the research group on intercultural processes in architecture, urbanism and territory, we welcome you to our social media networks to our first international seminar called Decolonizing Urban Territories, Process of State Colonization and Indigenous Resistance. The call for this seminar was, a, was directed to researchers trained under different colonial languages, both English and Spanish, to talk about various processes of dispossession faced today by indigenous peoples of work under logics and mechanisms of urban production to the continued canalization of territories within the nation state. With this goal, we shared several questions such as how is urban expansion advancing over territorial lands of indigenous communities? How are irregular urbanization processes occurring in rural areas where indigenous people live? How are ethnic real estate projects created and promoted? How are identities produced? through the construction of intercultural buildings and public spaces. What different actions are being carried out? What hybrid forms are emerging? These were part of the questions that we raised and we received several papers as an answer from different parts of the world, observing unique and unrepeatable processes in different times, from different disciplines and through different voices. They have shown us the wide and deep range of consideration, as well as the various forms in which these processes of urban colonization are expressed in different parts of the world, as well as the wide range of reorganization and resistance that indigenous people continue to develop. This showed also the validity and the re relevance of these territorial issues that we wanted to discuss beyond the academic formats to be able to encounter, to exchange ideas, to reflect critically, and also to create proposals. That is why we have created, or we have had different activities during this day. To this end, during the morning, we have round tables, and in the afternoon, we have conversation round tables with people who are engaged from different, from different perspectives, either art, public management, organizations, etc. All the tables in the seminar have the possibility of receiving questions from the audience through our social media. So we invite you to participate. This is going to be the last round public round table of this seminar and is also a special round table for us. That's why we invited people from different indigenous peoples and from different realities in this continent. We're talking today about different places in the Americas. This round table is called Indigenous Peoples and the Recovery of Vital Space in Cities. We are with Leslie Campbell from Mixman Nation. She works for Spanish Nation in Vancouver, Canada. We also have Leila Noriega from the community of Belen, from Arica, the town of Belen, and Janina Herrera from the La Fuente people, who is a student in our faculty and she's actively working here in Concepcion. The dynamics of, the run, of this round table is an exchange of ideas where the audience can participate with questions and comments from social media. And we will have four main moments. First, we're going to hear what we call in Mapulungun Pentukum, a brief 
presentation, you can introduce ourselves. Tell us about the place, your places of origin, where you live. Then we're going to talk a little about the past, the context of your peoples, the worldview of your people before the urban colonization processes. And we're also going to talk about the present and the future. What proposals do we have for the future? talking about the urban sphere. So I welcome you all. We are really happy to have a panel just composed by women. So please introduce yourselves briefly so we can get to know you. So for, for the people who are here, we are from the very end of the world, the south of the world. We know very little of what is happening on the other side. So Leslie, please introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. <laughs> I'm not sure where everybody's located um, in, in the world. But uh, so my name is Leslie Campbell. Uh, I'm Mi'kmaq from uh, Newfoundland, Canada. So that's on the east coast of, of the country. And uh, my family is from uh, Miabugeg is the Mi'kmaq name and Khan River is the English name. And I've been living on the other side of Canada for about 10 years or a little over 10 years in, um, in Vancouver, BC. So Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil territory are the three Indigenous nations that um, are located in, in this part of the country. Um, but I, I, for some of the context and uh, of where I'm coming from within British Columbia, where Vancouver is located, there are over 203 uh, Indigenous nations within just the province. So we are quite a diverse um, community and uh, peoples and um, it, it, I look forward to sharing a little bit more of what it's been like as a as a Mi'kmaq planner coming and working with the Squamish Nation. I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. So thank you very much for having me today. Leila, Leila, please. I was muted. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Okay. Leila Noriega Leila Noriega Satawa. Leila Noriega Segarra Satawa. Yo soy periodista. Soy ariqueña. I'm a journalist. I'm from Arica, and I am Aymara. And my territorial community is Belen. And that's why I'm pronouncing my second last name, Cigarra, which is the line of the territorial space that I've been to came from. And I appreciate the invitation of being here with you today to participate with you. Through this conversation, I'm going to share with you some of the experiences that we have had with what you call urban planning, how this meet our ways of understanding how to plan in rural areas mainly. We are uh, people that is migrating. It's a, we are a mobile people and it's one of our characteristics and maybe you have already heard about the conflicts that we have with the state when our ways of living confront the state policies they have these colonizing measures and they have a very bad political will let's say and we have less than 100 years in Chile. So that's for me as first part. Janina, please. Okay. 
Hello everyone, my name is Janina Herrera. As I was introduced, I have a Chilean surname, but I have a Mapuche La Gente Part of what I shared with you in the morning is how we see the territorial planning. Within that we have urbanism, but I would like to share with you how we see this from a wider perspective, not only from the urban plan. I'm almost finishing my studies as an architect. So I also have this view from a territorial perspective at a wider scale, more integrative scale. And later on, I'm also going to share a project that we're working on with Professor Mauro and a big group of architects, geographers, but we are recovering the poems that if we look at the registers, because these are names that were there even before the urbanization of the project, it's like going back in time to understand that bigger territorial picture and with the names, the native names. This also has a relation on how the territory behaves. So I think it's going to be an interesting conversation. That's going to be from me. Bueno, la idea es que conversemos, así que no, no quiero ponernos en un formato muy rígido, sino más bien conversar. Y, y lo primero que apuntamos, un poco contarnos entre todos, eh, ¿cuál es esta esta visión del pasado como pueblo tan previo a la llegada a los colonizadores. Yo sé que es una pregunta muy amplia. No, this is a very wide question, but this is to understand this process of the territories, how they are experienced regarding that past. This is a very open question because there is no just one question that can have only one answer. And I leave it up to you to who wants to answer. Leila, you have your mic muted. No, no, no. Okay, oh well. I will speak first. It's a wide, very broad question. I will share um, a map of, so you can know where I'm speaking from. I'm in the north border of Chile, near Bolivia and Peru. Bueno, cuando hablabas del pasado, ¿no? Solo para ubicar un poco. Cuando hablamos del pasado, aquí tenemos Arica en el circo. That's where I live. There we have Perú, Bolivia, and we have the sea. The other red circle, that's Belén, my mom's town. They have a very Christian name. Their native name would be Tokoroma and has a lot of names, but we identify also as Belen. This just seems like little towns, like old little territories, but this is us, actually. We live in the Coyasuyu, in the south part of Tawantinsuyu. And this is the Tawantin Suyo, which is the, like the border, that is what we used to be. We have Piwanaco, that's like birthplace of the Andinian community from the Titicaca. We have all the waters that come from there through these territories. Then we have the Aonaco that is composed by four areas. The territory where I'm from, 
it's from the whole South America. In the pre-Columbian colonization in this area, the Inca Imperium comes and they were also colonizers. And that's when we start getting to know potatoes and those kind of products in the South. From the Andinian world, there are a lot of narratives, but we can say that there are still marks of those way of livings in the area that I live in Arica and Parinacota. It's like an institute museum. We have mummies, we have archaeological elements and heritage elements and buildings or infrastructures that are still present and that let us know what kind of technologies were used in that time. And there are two practices that are present mainly in Bolivia and Peru of our past and showing who we were. We know these historical processes that I would like to mention because they are really important in what we are going to speak about the territorial disputes. First, we have the colonization, then the Christ Christianism, and then re the republics. We had the Peruvian Republic and then the Chilean Republic in the North part. And after the only war that Chile had with other countries, that's where that territory comes to be part of Chile. Today, we still have buildings that are part of the Peruvian and Bolivian government that are still present in this area, even though it's part of the Chilean territory. And this has had a great impact in the Andinian communities. We were incorporated to Chile after 1929. So we are not even part of this country for a long time. It's less than 100 years. Now we are just getting to reach 100 years and we still have marks and impacts. There is uh, extreme nationalism in, like in any border area, we are nations that come from the enemies of Chile. There is a culture of nationalism that is mixed with our identities and with the territorial decisions. And just so I don't speak too much, I would like to say that after the Pacific War, what happened with these indigenous territories? Peru, in Peru, they had the territory titles, and then we have this process of Chilenization, to say so, that is still underway, that where they regulate the territories, the lands, in the Chilean way, ignoring, of course, the traditional territories. We have a territory under one family that were actually of the whole community. Then we have communities that to protect themselves from this Chilean invasion, create these fears of territorial like um, secession, just so they could protect the territories. Other people just ran to Peru. There was persistence in this area. And I say it because this is not that happened that far away. It's kind of recent. We that are from this area, since the beginning, we have links and relationships to Bolivia and Peru. And this has an influence 
in our territoriality. I checked this, um, the presentation the other day of one of the women from the Ministry of Housing and Public Works, and I was listening to her about the disputes in the territories and the lack of housing and the majority of indigenous people that live here we do have titles and ownership of these lands and we lost we lost that or we acquired that during this time of the world i don't know how is leslie community but in our community, our grandparents will tell us you should not sell your land. So that's what we have done. We have had reclaims of territories because they are ours and we never sold it. We have titles like land titles. If, and if we don't have the Chilean land titles, we have the Peruvian ones that show that these are our territories. And there is a dispute in how, in a conflict in how the government understands this um, ownership of the land and how the people have protected their land. Thank you, Leila. You leave a good point there. I leave the word to anyone who wants to talk I don't know if Janina or Leslie want to talk now. I could go ahead. I'll, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. It's interesting listening to Layla. And there's definitely some shared, you know, experiences there or, or things that I could relate to. And I think of um, the history of, of my people and, and the journey that that we've been on, but it's also interesting because my my home territory, I'm actually about 8,000 kilometers away from my home territory. And so in Newfoundland, um, colonization really started around the 1500s. And even earlier, we had Vikings who came to our, our territory, but the 1500s in, in earnest, I suppose. And, um, but over here in British Columbia, it really started with the gold rush coming up from United States into British Columbia. So some of the communities here weren't even, um, I, I suppose, impacted until the late 1800s. And so those a few hundred years of colonization have um, can be quite different <laughs> in, in communities. But that being said, it was a strong force and a ravaging force. Um, and we're definitely still um, healing from that and it's still a long way to go but um, you know in terms of Squamish Nation I'll focus on that because I'm working with the Squamish uh, Nation community is that um, where where to start <laughs> so I would say you know um, the same thing happened uh, you know colonization settlers came into the country um, and across Canada they started with the Indian Act. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with that, but it's a piece of legislation that's still um, still in existence and still implemented to this day. And so um, Indigenous communities were put onto reservation, reserves, we call them in Canada, reservations in the United States, if you're familiar with that context. And um, that's largely where we still e exist. That's where our communities are. We still have reserves. I carry an Indian status card to prove that I'm I'm a member of a certain reserve. And so that's how they started um, taking us from our connections to land and community and our ways of, of knowing and existing and really try to impose um, Similar ways upon us and also you know similar the the church often thought we were less or not often did think we were less than and needed to be saved and so the the Indian Act started um, in 1867 and in 1876 we um, 
they started the residential school system in Canada. And so that's when children were forcibly removed and pulled from their families and put into Christian schools across the country. And uh, they experienced a, a lot of trauma there, a lot of physical, sexual, mental, emotional abuse. And the last residential school in Canada actually closed in 1996. So someone with, I, I in theory could have gone to a residential school in Canada. And so it um, had devastating impacts, of course, on, on our wellness and sense of self and our identity and connection to land. It was very effective form of colonization, uh, a very effective tool in terms of, in terms of that. Um, and Squamish Nation, uh, I, I am jumping a little bit ahead, but it is also, it happened in the past, but it's so present in Canada. We've also have, um, with uh, starting in about May, they've been discovering children's bodies at the schools. Um, they've been, um, right now, they've discovered about over 7,000 unmarked graves of the children who went to those residential schools. And so a lot of my work at the nation, of course, we all feel that. And so a lot of the work there has been focused on how do we move forward from that and take care of our, our people in our community. And, um, you know, Squamish Nation took a really um, in different approach than other nations across uh, Canada in that um, Squamish Nation used to be 23 separate um, nations and communities. And so when they saw um, colonization and the residential schools coming, uh, they, they recognized that they needed to come together as one. And so they actually signed a, a joint agreement between 23 different communities to become one Squamish Nation. And so, you know, that's stronger together is where they were coming from and it was seen as a way to um, carry on who, who they are as well in kind of the face of the federal government and it's it's had a really positive it was a really impactful decision for a lot of reasons but it was also connected to you know being still under the Indian Act and the federal government it impacts funding it impacts resources it impacts decision making um, so they, I mean, it, in the long term, it really has strengthened them as a nation and their capacity to move towards self-determination and sovereignty. And um, they're also unique in that, and we could talk about it a little bit later, in that three of their reserves or their communities are bordered by quite large municipalities. Um, you know, there's a, a couple million people around about half the reserves. And then the other half are, were quite rural. They were located uh, kind of down the valley, down a road, <laughs> about a, an hour. And they, with COVID, there's been a lot of growth because people are trying to get out of their urban centers. And so it's putting some more pressures on, on the community there. But uh, that is, I would say that's a really brief snapshot <laughs> of kind of the, the journey um, before. I can, I can say too, linked to that, um, something that I've been amazed and have been honored to be a part of is witnessing those pieces of their, their culture and their practices and their protocols still carry forward and learning a lot about their traditions and um, knowledge and plant medicines and governance and all those and how do we integrate that into the work we're doing now. And so they, you know, they're still, I would still say thriving, but there's um, of course this, this history that is still present that that I would say every indigenous person is still up against. Thank you so much, Leslie. Janina, the word for you. I thank Leslie and Leila. You are both great women. Well, the reality of the Mapuche people is not so different to what Leila said. There have been some similar parameters in the current situation of the people. 
we start from this historical context in which all of the indigenous peoples have their indigenous lands and the government and the settler systems that by the Spanish people and then the state of Chile who weren't kind to us in our territories. They were using dynamics uh, from the military. So this seminar also aims to cover these colonial spaces within the urban areas that are still there. They are increasingly get bigger. I introduced myself as an architect and I have also been thinking about how the territory is set and where does this can, the setting or configuration goes. And the current situation of the Mapuche people is that we also have this mobile origin. There are some people who say that the territory has always been very linked to the identity of the people. So depending on the territory, they had a different way to call themselves here in Chile, but also in Argentina. So we have these conceptions of the borders that is different from indigenous people. These borders are not linked or they don't have the same approaches that are imposed by the state or by urban system. So there is an interesting discussion. And I like to think about this in the discipline because the situation of the Mapuche people is, well, there is a urban conflict, but there is also a different conflict that has the same origin. How do we recognize this territory? And um, that's, I want to get to my speech, my presentation, right? The work I do, how we have moved forward to this process that sometimes tends to, to go maybe in a cycle with some other historical processes. So for example, in the urban space, these registers have been erased. The registers of the indigenous peoples that are always linked to live or elements that are alive, that are part of nature, fields, river, waterfalls, elements like that. So all of these are vital to human beings, for the Mapuche people, for the Aymara people, for indigenous nations as a whole, because we are more aware of our environment than these entities, the, the Chilean entity, we could say. Chilean people have this identity problem. They sometimes think about many things, but they don't really know their identity. They don't know their music, their colors, it's like they are disconnected. It's an identity that comes from many places, from many things. But for example, indigenous peoples tend to have an identity that is much clearer, that it comes from this heritage, from this history, from family, ancestor. As what Leila said, we say, okay, we have this land, we are not going to sell it because it's ours. It's not only mine, it, it comes from many, many years ago. So that's the context that we have right now with Mapuche people. They live mainly in cities. In fact, the biggest uh, percentage of Mapuche people, they live in Santiago, the capital of the country. And clearly this is a space that is more diverse in the capital of the country. And I'm going to show you a map a cartography that we are working on, and it's from Concepcion. Here you can see the file. So this map, this cartography 
has the intention of remembering the original territory. This was created, uh, well, it is not ready yet. We are working on it. We have done this only with the bibliographical registry that we have recovered from different sources where this kind of information has been registered. This always is related to some kind of behavior of the territory. So in the morning, I talk about Walpen that I'm showing you with my cursor now. Why Walpen? Because we have these hills that are very big. And from these places, you can look around. That's what Walpen means, look around. And you can see all the place and all the surroundings. That's also what happens in Penteweno. And they have a big conception of the lightning. So all the names have a configuration and all the processes that happen in these territories. And what we have realized making this map, even though we write the names, it's of the places, it's very difficult to identify the boundaries. We cannot say, okay, this is Walpem. It is very difficult to set the boundaries. And we cannot do that because we realize that it's not the same logic that we have now, nowadays with the urbanists that we do projections and so on. But here we're talking about a full boundary, let's say we're talking about a full territory, something that is big and that is not fragmented. And this vision, this fragmented vision has been imposed to us. So from the city, the truth is that we are trying to come back to this history to talk with the elders and start remembering how this place was before. So we can also start creating or making projections or new ways of doing architecture or urbanism, a way that is rethinking these territories and that is generating an urbanism that is different where this logical, this fragmented logical is not there the other way around. It's to understand how the territory is stronger, how the water courses have memory and will always be there because these are very big basins that come from Argentina many times. So how from urbanism and architecture can we remember this and make it as, a, as an important layer when planning the cities? That's also, uh, well, right now we are in a, an ecological situation where we cannot continue to plan without taking into account resources asking ourselves how we are using water, how we are living in the cities, how we are making them grow to the rural spaces, all these processes of colonization and gentrification. So looking at all of these issues, we that we are aware of all of these things and we are also aware of our pasts and the traditions that the elders and the ancestors have, so I, I didn't know that before, for example, the traditions I'm learning them now that I'm older. So we are finding now this kind of things, these reflections that I also like to bring to my studies because I think this is a most solid way in which I can be a contribution. From the cities, I feel like this is a fragmented history and I can re build it from this point of view, from architecture, from a, a new architecture perspective to look for solutions. And this is the way I think I can be a contribution 
these conversations, these kind of seminars, because it, this is the only way in we start realizing many things. So it's a pleasure for me to be here talking about this. I'm also very interested. I really liked when Leila said that people remember their territories. So they are always linked to natural spaces, to spaces that are rich in nature. Thank you, Janina. In order to start maybe tracing this conversation, I think it's very interesting that the common denominator here is to understand that even though we're talking, we're speaking from different places, processes such as evangelization um, or all of this nationalization or the idea of a state when it's settled. This starts to set boundaries, borders, and in the words of the three of you, this, this comes up the state set borders in an area where the people are left. So this is also linked to the factor of property. What is it left for them? What is the right they have to use? And I would like to, to bring the conversation to this kind of stories, even though we they are from 200 years ago, let's say. How this condition that the state has determined, it changes the present. For example, Janina was saying that she was born in the city. And Leila, you were saying that your town was always there. Is the state the one that arrives and sets an idea of a city? So it's something different. It's a different expression. But Leslie was saying that what they did was to take us out and take us somewhere else. So there are different strategies. And how do you think that this determines the present and what are the struggles that arise from this in the places where you are from? It's an open question about these struggles nowadays. Okay, so I'm going to speak. <laughs> sure. Yes, what Janina said happens here as well. And, and I imagine that in the whole world, that indigenous people are living in the cities nowadays. And in the city, our traditions, our ways of life, are also replicated, but we must never lose the contact with our territory. Sadly, there are some generations that are born without land, without knowing where their origin is or where they come from. And of course, these experiences, you have to stop them, you have to look for them, you have to talk with elders. Because in the moment that you lose contact with your territory, you lose a lot. For example, we have lost our language, and it's a way of understanding that. And we are in the process of learning it again. And we have to learn, we have to thank, sorry, migration. Because here in Arica, if it wasn't for people from Bolivia or Peru, we would have lost our language. Nonetheless, the, these particular uh, characteristics of the territories have been lost because this state has been violent. We are now in a process to change our constitution and we have seen examples of violence that are not so old. So we can see it, for example, in the generation of our parents. For example, my mom went to work to Santiago, to the capital, and she had kept her, her hair. 
she kept her hair. And I didn't understand it when I was younger. But when you have to cut your hair and to fit, let's say, I, I interpret this as a survival strategy. And we resist somehow, we create this way of resistance. And then we come back, we always come back to our land. And that's something we must not forget. And the state doesn't understand this. They don't understand that we come back. And regarding conflicts, I will tell you the conflicts we are having now regarding territory, because in the city, the context is different. We cannot say, okay, we are only Aivas. In my town, Belen, I was born in Arica, but my territory is Belen. Here, there, my, my family, there are some people who also identify themselves as Quechua. We also have Afro-descendants Afro that came from Peru, from Bolivia. Many of the dances of the Andean world are related with this Afro-indigenous tradition. So we are in this cultural mosaic and it's very difficult to go back to what we had before, but that's our reality now and our identity now. So, Mauro, I'm going to share something if I can, relating the struggles in the territory and also in the city. So this is Belen. It's a typical town of the mountains. This was founded by the Spanish settlers. So here we have a religious festivity because Catholicism is now mixed with Andean traditions. This is a very beautiful part of my town. It's called Tojotojone. And here we have different caves and it's a sanctuary. We have a virgin that takes care of our town. And this was one of the struggles that brought us together. So one of the factors that we are facing, one of the issues that we're facing is extractivism. That's one of the main struggles. Extractivism of water, of minerals, it happens a lot in the north of Chile, but also in the Andes in general. We have a lot of mineral resources. So there we are with different Aymara women, and we go out to defend the territory. As you can see here, we have also our elders, women elders from different towns of this mountain. And they came and they walked with us because they defend their territory. So here we are in the October movement, October 2019 movement. So this extractivist project install and they modify our ways of life. But not only extractivism modify our territories, it also happens in the city. Arica has a special law regarding pollution and the consequences it has in people. Because in Arica, they received trash from a foreign company and it was there and above this, they built houses. So we have this kind of conflict in the urban space regarding the territory and extractivism. We also have a big presence of these environmental organizations. Our region doesn't have this that is called tailings. Our region doesn't have tailings, but they say we have six. And once again, 
they were throwing trash here in peripheric cities such as Arica or Andean regions that we also have a border with Peru and Bolivia. That's why we think that we need a soil law or a soil act that says what do we have and where and that they stay transparently where there is pollution. We have in the 80% of this territory, archeological traces. Nonetheless, we live in this sacrifice zones. That's a concept that we have here in Chile. And in these sacrifice zones, the state built houses, a port where we receive toxic things, toxic trash daily. Another thing that is an issue is the regulatory plans. Last year, there that more than 95 of these plans asked for a consultation process and only two had one. And if we don't have a prior indigenous consultation, we don't have the opportunity to participate and to give our focus to this urbanist projects. We don't know what the soil is going to be used for, what the territory is going to be used for. So there wasn't this indigenous consultation that in Chile we have the covenant once now. It's the only way we have, the only way that exists. So in Putre, we also didn't have this. The social services haven't well, they said that it wasn't necessary, that it wasn't proper, because the people participating were already indigenous. So one of the main danger for us was that and there are Andean territories that want to be urbanized. And what for? For hotels? In Chile, we don't have indigenous institutionality with the state. We don't have a council. We don't have anything. We just have CONADI, which is the national uh, department of indigenous people. And it doesn't have um, a very strong influence, let's say. So we have this regulatory plan and we never received an explanation. And on top of that, it was made in the pandemic. So they were saying, okay, okay let's now make a consultation that because these indigenous people don't even have access to internet because of course we have to pay for it and it's expensive. So we made a call from different territories here in the North and we went to avoid these meetings because we said that it wasn't proper to do this online consultation processes because we couldn't participate. And the housing is doing nothing here. Um, a company that is working on this hasn't done anything. They told us they were sending us information, but they haven't done it. And we are informing people that this is a danger because it is a danger for us. And then later you can check our Facebook page. We have there the, the speeches that people give and we don't want other people to come and tell us what to do because we know how to take care of our space, of our territory. We have a common a uh, community cemetery, we have different things, and none of the laws consider the indigenous pers perspective. We don't have anything, even for the famous housing committees that are now popular in Arica, and they use these apps to give territories for housing. 
So we don't agree with these decisions being taken top down. We disagree with this. And to our extent, we try to make visible our concerns because there is no consultation, there is no participation from us. Also, they use a super technical language that we don't understand. There are maps that we don't understand. We also have this problem that they had seven stages and they were on the fifth stage when they just come to us to tell us something about this in the fifth stage of seven. So it seems like indigenous consultation is only for education, for culture, but not when we talk about territory or when we want to stay establish some kind of interculturality or indigenous perspective. It's heritage law that is stuck there and we don't know that it's going to happen. We also have that from the rural areas, they have their movement. So a brief historical context. When we are a democracy, once again, we ask for these territories and the Chilean democracy, let's say, they gave some properties to the military and they were exchanging, let's say, a state land for indigenous land. And they made this Siena agreement for military to be able to do exercise and do their trainings, all of these things. In the border, we had five armies and they even militarized militarize this even more from different communities. So due to this, uh, thanks to these people in, in the towns, we are aware of this information now. This place that is called Pampa Campanal, we have a very farming dependent sector they are asking for this decree to be revoked so they can get their lands back. So the state understand that these territories are land of no one, but that's not like that. They are wrong. And here we have also the people from Socoroma. They we're having this demonstration. If it wasn't for the old people, the elders, we wouldn't be aware of this. So all of this is made between different generations. So these are part of the conflicts that we have nowadays, precisely from these laws, from these acts, these measures that are taken from the city, from the capital, from the urban spaces. And they, of course, affect us. So just for you to know, this plan didn't move forward because the regional council, they said no because communities weren't involved. So this plan of Putre, the plans of the municipality development haven't either ask us and they are deciding on us. So we don't need just like a declaration on the constitution. We see that it has happened in Bolivia and Ecuador. Extractivism is still there and it still affects indigenous people. So it has to be something more than just a declaration in the in the law. So we have to be asked, what do we understand by interculturality? So they are still violating our rights. They still see us as something from the prehistoric. And maybe I don't use it to be called press, but I am just as Marian as someone who does wear this. 
So I, I previously had no idea about these things regarding the plans, the maps, and young architectures have helped us to understand in a very autonomous way with the support of these leaders we have been following up this. Thank you very much, Leila. Can you tell us in your territories how are the disputes of the Squamish nation? The conflicts in this logic that keeps uh, coming back from the state. Yeah, um, I was, I'm just so interested in what everybody else is saying. <laughs> it takes me a moment. Um, yeah, I, you know, within Canada and and within, you know, the courts and the legal system over, you know, starting in the 90s uh, and, and into the 2000s, there have been some really significant legal wins in terms of Indigenous communities and recognizing, um, recognizing their sovereignty and also that we have to be meaningfully consulted if there's going to be any sort of development or um, whether it's resource extraction or even just building on the land. And um, sometimes when we are, sometimes we're not consulted meaningfully and uh, things get caught up in court or, and sometimes we don't win, but I, I could definitely relate to what Layla was saying around some of the resource development. You know, there's a number of, um, you know, protests and activism and legal challenges happening, particularly in terms of oil and um, uh, a pipeline that is supposed to be going through the territory. And, you know, you know, that being said, though, there is kind of this standard that, you know, Squamish Nation has to be consulted. Um, and there's also within Canada, probably starting, I, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, recognizing the impacts of colonization. And it was a whole process and um, different levels of government have tried to embed that within their, their policies and plans and, and legislation to varying degrees of success. And I, I would say, I would say there's a lot of criticism for that movement, uh, you know, a, a lot of Indigenous people say people, that non-Indigenous governments tried to jump to the reconciliation without recognizing the truth and that a lot of the changes they're trying to implement are surface level. But that being said, they do have things on paper that they are in theory accountable to. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, when it comes to when it comes to the pressures from the outside state, there's definitely the conflict there. But um, Squamish Nation has quite a, um, it's quite a, I would say, powerful nation in that it's a very large nation compared to others. You know, for there's about only about there's about five thousand members of Squamish Nation. About half of them live in the community or more. But um, comparatively, or in comparison, the last nation I worked with only had about 300 people. So Squamish is a fairly large nation, and we do have a lot of internal capacity and staffing and, and knowledge and resources to counteract some of these pressures. And um, so a lot of, you know, developers and levels of government really work hard to get Squamish on side. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the steps but you know as a staff person it, it, it is a lot it is a lot of work and a constant balance because you know we get hundreds of different referrals and requests you know sometimes we get dozens on a given day and so if we just focused on those those requests or you know demands we wouldn't be able to do any planning for our actual communities because it would be so outward focused. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's definitely a big challenge. It can take a lot of um, 
a lot of, you know, human resources or some of our financial resources to, to work with that. So I would say a lot of my work is trying to figure out um, with my colleagues how we can work with those different levels of government and, and some of those outside, outside pressures and requests. But the Squamish has recently taken some like really big stances around the territory in terms of um, logging is very in the forestry sector is really really um, big within within the province but particularly around Squamish Nation territory and recently we've um, passed a, I, I don't I don't know if you'd call it a bill but or or I don't I don't know exactly the legal term of it but essentially we said no more um, old growth logging on the territory of, of cedar in particular. Cedar trees are um, very connected to the Squamish people and, you know, built houses, there's medicines, there's, um, you know, the connection to the whole ecosystem and the forestry sector and the different levels of government were quite taken aback by that. It could have a lot of implications there. So there, there's definitely places where the nation is standing up and saying no. And, um, and I would say compared to even just a couple decades ago, there's more likelihood that Squamish will be heard within those 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 contexts. Um, yeah, I, I have been thinking a lot about, you know, as Layla was speaking about the, the land and that connection to, to land and some of the work that we're doing. And, um, you know, something that I just believe is that, you know, as Indigenous people, we are the land. Like it's not, um, there's no clear start and finish. We're, we're really connected. It's who we are. It's in our spirit. It's in our body. And, um, and so moving forward, actually, Squamish Nation is doing some land use planning, and that will be really amazing because we're going to be connecting with the elders and um, knowledge keepers. And um, and it's been interesting, too, because even yesterday I was talking to a, a non-Indigenous colleague about how do we do some of that planning. And, you know, I was sharing my my husband is from he's also Indigenous. He's from uh, Heisla. It's a Heisla and Dekel nations, and it's in northern BC. And I was just sharing how within um, even from my Mi'kmaq stories and his stories and some of our teachers from other nations, almost all of our nations have stories about um, prophecies. We have prophecies about how um, the world is going to be set on fire. The world is going to experience a great flood. The world is going to have a great sickness. And then in the prophecy, it says you have to move. You have to go north. You have to go to the mountains. And, you know, my husband and I in our family, we live in this urban center. And we've seen that happen in BC. We've had the most on record forest fires. We just had a major flood. Um, it, and with a, lo a lot of like a, a lot of our major roots are have been destroyed. And I was saying, and we also have a long term plan to get out of the city, we need to go back to the mountains, we need to go back to his territory and his land. And that's where we need to raise our family. And I, you know, I, I was saying this is, this is the challenge for non indigenous folks coming to work with us, because that is what I'm planning for. And that is what I am going to incorporate into our reports and our plans and our decision making and our actions and what we fund moving forward. And so it was, um, you know, my colleague was quite, quite shocked at that in that moment because they can't, they couldn't comprehend it. And so I think, you know, that intercultural communication piece that Layla was talking about is so, um, it's so essential, but that's where some of those misunderstandings happen too, because, um, someone who doesn't have those teachings or have that connection isn't going to think in that way. And so often we come to the table with really different assumptions on how we're going to move forward. And, you know, that's also something I've been learning a lot at the nation is that, um, you know, that understanding of planning and time is not straight. It's not a straight line. It's that circular piece of bringing and bringing things and those threads back from the past. And so, that's kind of been, um, I mean, that's, I would say, a unique challenge and a lot of 
um, opportunities there, but we're often trying to articulate that to some of those outside forces when there's still a lot of that misunderstanding. And then, you know, as I touched on before with the residential schools, or even why we're defending, you know, some of the, you know, the land and, and not wanting some of the development, there's a lot of that tension with the society as a whole. And, and a lot of racism, you know, around there and misunderstanding. And so that's kind of the, the context at the nation, but we've, we've been moving forward with a lot more inward focused planning. And so that's where my role has been of, you know, how can we plan for the community, whether it is, you know, um, urban design, designing our communities in a way that reflected Squamish ways of, of living in the past, you know, and what does that look like? And what does our healthcare system look like? What does wellness look like for us? Um, so we've been doing a lot more inward um, focused planning and, and kind, of, kind of just going for it, I suppose. <laughs> um, because, yeah, you could, you, we could spend all our time and all our resources on kind of those outside pressures. And so making those decisions internally first and then having um, rather than reacting to what's happening on the outside. Um, yeah, that was a bit, I, I have, I, I have so much to share, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm really enjoying listening to Layla and Yamina. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, Yanina. Thank you, Leslie. Yanina. Do you have anything to say? Yes, about the future? No, no. About the present. How do you see in downtown the the conflicts and all? Yeah, it would have been good to share the other part of the investigation that we are carrying out, where our goal is to have a toponymic cartography in a social uh, environment cartography maybe in the future we will have a opportunity to share our entire work but when you have these layers of what the past territory was and with the current environmental conflicts when you have these social environmental conflicts We have these conflicts with water, with the free spaces that we that we still have in the Ur the urban area. Also, the sacred places where there are there are still uh, native communities or or spaces that have a spiritual significance that's very relevant that are being threatened by these housing projects, water projects. And we see how this generates a conflict in the present. We see these two sides of this native vision that is more linked to spirituality and this other perspective that is more about extra extractivism and in models that are not sustainable. In the present, we're already on the edge of how we keep these rural places that are still there. So I think that in the present, we're talking about a climate emergency regarding how we change the political models, the projectation models, and how we expand the rural territories, and also considering the political programs of the native people, of how they understand their territory and how they will rebuild their old territories. I don't want to only speak about the Mapuche territory because Chile is a country with many different indigenous people. Sometimes we are 
uh, centered in Mapuche world, but I also take the words from Leila and Leslie, and I believe that all of us have this vision of rebuilding our territory, being more realistic. We can learn from the mistakes of the past, of the industrialization process in the continent and the whole world, where we still have prints, footprints that have not been repaired. And we need scientific resources and of other kinds. And I believe that the present and the future shouldn't be built based in that previous perspective, in that past perspective. We are in a present where we already left a mark, a footprint, but we have technology, we have science where we can rely on to, to have support and native people also can support in that and rely on that. My um, university education has brought me closer to my culture. I, as I said, I was born in the city, but with my um, university education, I have been learning stuff that maybe I didn't learn from my family, but that I am gathering through my research in the cities. So we have to take um, advantage of those tools that we are having now to help the native communities. Now we have more advantage regarding education, for example. Haim was talking yesterday in one of, in one presentation, saying, talking about the privilege that we have in some positions that we have. I am in the city, but in the rural area, the Mapuche conflict is worse. So from my privilege, I can do stuff like putting on the table some Davids, speaking about replanification, questioning the decisions that we're taking before and how we should change them. I could position myself and say, yeah, let's go back to our original territory. But in the current days, we're still Mapuches and we're still natives in the cities. And that's not something that we are going to change tomorrow or in a year. So how we can take responsibility in a dignifying way for the native people. And from this, a conscious of mestizaje, like racial mixture, there are some uh, native people that believe that they are pure to say so in blood in, in their history, but it's not like that. Even though I am Janine Herrera, I do think about how this city should be built in the future. And also looking at these previous layers, I don't see the city as a gray matter or what is already built, but I see those layers also of the nature, how we can rebuild these elements with new proposals. So these are things that we should not forget. We should recover them and it should be important to create schools, intercultural schools, so kids can start learning again their mother tongue, their native tongue. So those are ways of how we can rebuild ourselves. Janina, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting you. No, 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 I already finished. Leslie has to go. So I just wanted to give her the space so she can say bye. Yeah, yeah, I already finished, don't worry. And then we can finish all together. Leslie, I give you the words. And I should say thank you first that you made this effort and came here virtually. And um, leaving the door open so we can meet again in another 
moment and now give you the word so you can say anything you want. Oh, thank you so much. And I am sorry that, that I have to go. I, I am really enjoying the conversation. I, I was telling um, uh, Magda that I did try to, I did try to change my next meeting, but I, I have that. And also my little one has to go for a nap and her time, her, her sense of time isn't as flexible as ours. <laughs> so, um, so unfortunately I have to go. I, I did want, I did want to say, and, and I don't want to put um, Magda on the spot, but she may be able to share a little bit about um, comprehensive community planning. And so that's a, an approach and a process that we're using at Squamish Nation about um, planning for the future. We're calling it our generational plan. And so uh, the, the hope is to bring all Squamish home. And, and what does that look like in terms of housing, in terms of land use and education? And it's a, it's a really neat, um, an interesting approach to planning because it's, it's community driven and community led uh, and something I'm very passionate about. But um, yeah, I, the, the one thing I, I, I wanted to share and it seems a bit random, but at the start, some of you may have seen um, I have a, a cup with a with a turtle and Magda said that is so pretty and I actually got it because my um, my daughter uh, her her name means mother of turtles in our language it's an ancestral uh, name and so my husband and I we have English names we grew up um, quite disconnected because of some of the things that have happened in our family. And so we're working really hard to connect our children with our ways of life and some of that knowledge and really having that guide the steps we take. And so, but the, the interesting thing about her name in the Mi'kmaq language is that it's pronounced Mahia. And I know in Spanish, that means magic. And I, I always really appreciated that because she is magical. And, you know, even listening today and hearing some of the connections and those shared experiences, um, it kind of just brought that brought that home, <laughs> literally. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to Magda. And I did want to thank the translators as well. I've really appreciated them uh, making it able for me to be a part of this conversation. So Thank you so much. And maybe we'll meet again. <laughs> Take care. Gracias, Liz. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. We say thank you to Leslie. She left the invitation to Magda to join, to show us or tell us about this Thing that they are planning in the future. Just to finish, Janina already put on the table a proposal to rethink the future, how we should rethink the, the future. It wasn't the intention to uh, speak in this round table about planification, but we end up here. And I think what Leslie said about our planification is not lineal nor vertical, it's circular. And I take what Leila said about coming back to the territory to start listening again, the knowledges. This is something that take us to the cosmovision. I think that the Indigenous people don't have these like vertical or linear thinking. But we have this question about the future. We shouldn't do things because we don't think that there is a future. So how do we see this future? How do we see this future? Or how you see the future with this um, a state structure that is probably not going to change. Like Leila said, with the constitution here, maybe things will change, but no, nothing assures that. So how can we approach this? 
this situation and Magdalena maybe also can speak about this since you have worked with Leslie I leave open the question of how you see what's coming I don't know if Janina or Leila want to start or so maybe then I can explain something <laughs> okay I will start since I don't like talking and then I will start I think those are two different contexts this is a conversation that we have to have as a native people how Janina said that internal converse, conversation with David and this is not to be extreme separating us it's because it's real we are the ones that have the outer determination how we decide how we are because the reality within the native people is very different like the Aymaras from Bolivia and Peru are very different and the Aymaras of Tarapacá even the the mother language we have a different we have that context of speaking and the autonomic uh, process that we define with the past present there is another thing that's related as we said the Hiwahanaka that said the first the prime minister of bolivia us and all of us so we have a conversation of our native community and the other native communities and that for us is here in in, in chile and this is a debate that the state has planned very well so we cannot have this debate among all of us we have other time frames and and that it is like that it's not that i took it from a book and then we have this other conversation and debate that comes naturally in a parallel way and in parallel to the state and it's key the academic people the ones that know the researchers and that for many years have not been here in the north in the current days we're very grateful that important people that are in the state in the government speak against extractivism but that in the 80s and 90s they were not there but we are now in a new era we have resisted more than 500 years so maybe a few more years of this chilean state it's nothing there are different stages and in the indigenous world it's not only one thing is just it's a whole configuration that is not linear and where we go and come back it's like the universe in the andinian cosmovision the elders will look the universe at the stars and with that they explained life that's what we should do speak among ourselves because the aymaras are very good for business we're very good at doing business they say i have a little bit of this okay give me that much money so we have some skills to say like that in people have known how to survive this model and adapt and that's why the they say that the indigenous are more structured and rigid and that's why we vote for the right wing but it's not like that 
we had different classes, economic classes and divisions here also. Um, and that is what is still being kept until now. It is interesting how we present ourselves in this reality. We live in the city and we have three houses. We have in the free Cordillera, in the valley and in the city. Um, you have a lot of houses. No, no, but it's not that we have money, it's that we move like that. It's another way of moving and the, another way of the relationship of this. When you are lazy, it, you are very judged. Here in the native people die working and doing. You don't ask for something. You are not making me doing a favor. You, It's what you have to do. So the public policies and the state has ignored this. And we see how they talk about this um, territorial administration where we are still invisible. I'm very worried about the national good minister because it's very worrying because they give land without water, without help, and this help is only contributing to the black market of water. So you start taking advantage of these resources. And I think this is something important. The violations to the human rights of the native people. This is open. This this haven't this hasn't stopped with the arrival of the democracy. What Chilean state did was not only a land occupation and about titles. This was a genocide. And this is a huge crime. And that's a pending point. Like the Chileans that suffer for the dictator dictatorship, we also suffered. And that's a good exercise that they should that they should take care take that and start talking with the native communities. I think there are different levels, but we are also the ones that decide how we're going to organize ourselves. And if there are professionals, investigation, that's always necessary. That happens a lot with the consultancy and the territorial conflicts and the zoning plan. We're always there reinventing ourselves and out uh, informing us informing ourselves because they don't want us to to know and to keep this model and this is a challenge for everyone Magdalena tell us a little about what Leslie was saying thank you very much for the space I'm going to be very brief. Uh, what Leslie was saying is very connected to what Leila was saying. The importance of self-determination and the autonomous processes and who has the power to take decisions, the power of decision making in different matters. Uh, environment, community, etc. And the processes that Leslie, Leslie was mentioning in this concept, comprehensive community planning, that in Spanish could be something like planificación comunitaria holística, 
This is a mechanism of making planning that is quite innovative in this context of indigenous peoples. And it is an instrument that the Canadian government, the federal Canadian government, as you know, Canada is a federal state, so we have a central government that has the responsibility of dialogue and link with indigenous peoples in the provinces. And then there's municipalities, there are three levels of government. And this is an instrument from the federal government that is associated to, um, it has had by very different communities and indigenous peoples, especially in British Columbia, that it generates an umbrella for this kind of comprehensive planning processes. And when it talks about community, it's communities, the ones that leads these processes. They define their priorities. This means that it has like a long, it is, it might be a long process, but it is understood as something holistic, of something comprehensive. Um, there have been lots of conversation. Leslie and I met in a planning school, and this concept of comprehensive community planning really is linked to this notion of indigenous planning, recognizing indigenous peoples in Canada or in other places that have been there since forever. So in the Western world, we talk about different ways of urban organization, spatial organization, human relations, and other ways of life as well. This existence and coexistence in the different environments where we are part of. This transcends the Western view. So the idea of comprehensive community planning is a big enough umbrella to make these processes easier. I think I'm going to end here because we don't have much time that this Squamish nation has been doing a very strong work in this sense, linked to the Canadian context, and they took advantage, let's say, this institution, institutions of what in Chile would be equivalent to the indigenous law because all of these communities came together and this allowed the community. Leslie, for example, she works for one of the people just like a person works the full time with uh, remuneration. So they have their own planning department. So in that comes context Leslie could definitely explain better. Also considering the legal, the political context that has allowed the open up of this space. Magdalena, could you please explain a bit more? So the Spanish nation is a nation itself, so they have their own ministry, they regulate their own planning ways. It, are they like an authority? So the system here in Canada, once again, I don't want to answer things that I'm not so familiar with, especially the legal context, but the Squamish is this, the Squamish nation, the Squamish people, this sense from state, the recognizing, a recognition of the state from a point of view of the state perspective, it is recognized. So to make a parallel with the Chilean side, it's like they have a legal person. As Leslie said, these are 23 
communities with a legal person that they got together under a bigger umbrella that is known as Squamish Nation. But that denomination is, is complex because once again, there is a big variety of peoples. There are multiple peoples that exist and that share language and territories. Uh, there are overlappings in territory and borders, but for administrative matter, the Squamish nation exists as a legal entity that reflects or shows, let's say, at least um, a big part of the population that identifies themselves as Squamish Even though in Canada, this, uh, a, there should exist a relation between nation to nation from Canadian state and indigenous nation. In practice, it's very colonial and it's not a, it's not a, a horizontal relation as we would like it to be. But Squamish doesn't have ministries, but they have department, education, health, planning, and they take decisions, they have the decision may, making on certain matters, always under the margins of the state. I, I don't know if that helps a bit. Yes, yes, I, I had that question because you were speaking about this federal country, but in the daily life, of course it's different, but I think I understood about the Spanish nation. The, oh, we have it too close. It, especially because of the education that is quite tiring. So we thank you. It was a very good conversation. It was so good that we couldn't even include comments from the audience. It's the first time we tried to do these links with people from abroad. So thanks to the virtual sphere and thanks to you of course this is a good opportunity to wrap up all of the conversations we have had if you couldn't watch them please still watch them in our youtube channel and it is a very relevant discussion as Janina said we have a, a small comfort zone regarding the academics the academia and it's not that we take um, this topics into account because we want to win something they really move us so leila you were saying about giving a space to this autonomous spaces this autonomous processes so we really hope that this is the first version of many more. So thank you very much, Leila, Janina, Magdalena, and Leslie. We also thank to our audience. Thank you for watching us on the other side. See you on other events. Thank you very much and see you again in a while. Bye, Leila. Bye, Magda. Bye, Janina. Bye, Leila. Thank